Okay, so uh, we've been looking at uh, shear force embedding moment diagrams in beams, and specifically we've done a, a couple videos now on a point load. So I'll put a couple of cards up here to, to bring you back to look at those problems in case you haven't. And now what I want to do is just introduce the uniformly distributed load because it's going to uh, add a, a wrinkle, if you will, or a degree of complexity in the shear force emitting moment diagram generation using the graphical method. And uh, so I wanted to do that. It's, it's still very doable. We're using exactly the same relationships. It just raises everything up by uh, an order. Uh, and so, uh, you know, that, that throws some people for a loop. And, and so we want to be able to get on that and make sure that we understand it and can deal with it. So uh, in this problem, we have a uniformly distributed load. It's got a magnitude of four kilonewtons per meter. Uh, I've already gone ahead, done the free body diagram, solved for the reactions, and you can see those laid out on the sheet. And so what I want to do is to jump right into the shear force diagram, apply those relationships we discussed in the last video, and make sure that we can use them effectively in generating a shear force emitting moment diagram. So as we discussed in the last video, a point load, externally applied point load, will cause a discontinuity in the shear force diagram with an immediate change equal to the magnitude of that force. And so we start at point A, going left to right, and the first thing we have is that reaction force of 8 kilonewtons. And so similar to, to what we saw the last time, that 8 kilonewtons is going to cause an increase in our shear force diagram equal to its magnitude. So I'm just going to draw the line up in here and note that it takes it up to 8 kilonewtons. What happens from there, of course, is that we have this uniformly distributed load. And what we're going to see is that the shear force diagram is going to change uh, as per the area under or the negative of the area under the uh, load intensity diagram. So we have a uniformly distributed load, which has a constant force. And so it's going to cause us a, a linear change in our shear force diagram with the slope of our shear force diagram equal to the magnitude of the uh, uh, load intensity diagram. Again, it's pushing it down, so we're, we're, we're going to be going down in the negative, uh, so we have a positive 4 kilonewtons per meter, but that's going to cause a change in our shear force diagram in the negative direction. So we have a couple things we know is across from A to B, it's all uniform, and so there are no discontinuities uh, occurring there, so we'll have a smooth curve between A and B, and that the change in our shear force diagram is equal to that area under the load intensity diagram. So we have four kilonewtons multiplied by four meters. And so that's going to cause us a change in our shear force diagram of 16. So we know we're going to arrive over here at point B at negative eight, because we started at eight minus 16 takes us to negative eight. So how's it gonna do that? So if it is a constant, uh, force a, in the free body diagram, then that is going to cause us a linear change because the magnitude of the load intensity diagram is equal to the slope. So we have a slope of negative four. So we have a straight line that connects our positive eight with our negative eight. We get to point B and we have our point load our reaction by, which is eight, and brings us back to zero. And as we noted before, we get back to zero. That's good because we have to start and end at zero. And that's our shear force diagram. So what we want to do now is to prepare ourselves to go on to the bending moment diagram. So I just want to note what these areas are in here. So area is equal to one half times eight times the base in this case, which is two meters. Uh, so that's equal to 8. And this is the same, but I'll write it in just so we see what we're doing. Is equal to 8. Again, we're going to use those relationships. So we want to deal with that first point. So up to the midpoint, we have uh, an area under a shear force diagram is equal to 8. We know that the area under the shear force diagram is equal to the change in moment. So between point A and the midspan, 
we have a change in moment of positive 8. So I'm just going to write that value in here as we have to get to a, a value of 8. And you can already see that the second half between midspan and point B, we have an area of equal to, I should write that down as negative 8. Uh, that takes us back to 0. So we know three points on our bending moment diagram. We know 0 at both ends and 8 at midspan. So now let's look at the slopes. So if we go to our shear force diagram at point 8, we have a magnitude of 8. And we know that the magnitude of the shear force diagram is equal to the slope of the bending moment diagram. So I'm just going to draw myself in a little cheater line. So approximate, say, that's a, about a slope of 8. And when we get to midspan, we see that it has uh, the shear force diagram has a magnitude of zero, which means that there's going to be a zero slope at midspan. We also know because this is a linear line that it is going to go up by one order, and so it's going to be parabolic. And so I can go ahead, based on those slopes and magnitudes and shape, I can draw that line in to look something like that and it starts to get a little bit untidy we get rid of the, our little cheater lines and then we do the same thing for the second half so we know we're starting at a slope of zero at midspan and we're going to finish with a slope of negative eight when we get to point b and i'll just put a little, little cheater tangent there and so i can draw that curve in to look something like that and it's all just a, a, a approximate. That's our bending moment diagram. So we have our shear force diagram. We have our bending moment diagram. We have our maximum bending moment at midspan, which we know the value of. Uh, we can certainly go on to figure out the equations of either of these if we need them for a particular reason. Uh, so that's really the wrinkle, if you will, of adding in the uniformly distributed load. Everything is going to step up in order. Instead of a constant shear force diagram, you're going to have a linear line. Instead of a, a linear bending moment diagram, now you're going to have that parabolic uh, curve in there. So the graphical method still very effective. Relationships identical to what we saw before. Uh, we just need to apply them in a, a little bit more deliberate way and make sure that we're using those slopes to get the proper shape to our bending moment diagram. So hopefully that was useful to you. We're certainly going to be seeing a lot of beams with uniformly distributed load and point loads and combinations thereof uh, applied to them coming up. So getting a handle on these relationships, getting practiced with them so that we can use them uh, quickly and efficiently uh, is going to really help us uh, with our problems uh, moving forward. That's that for this one. Uh, we've got lots more coming up. I'll put some links uh, to the uh, next series or the next video in the series, and uh, hopefully we'll see you out for that.